My name is Massimo, and I grew up in a place called Erie, which is a town in the very far south of Italy, in a place called Calabria. Erie is a very beautiful place, and in many ways, I was lucky to grow up there. But in other ways, being born there comes with a bit of a curse. Loy and Calabria, in general, have beautiful scenery, incredible food, and for the most part, very friendly people. However, Erie also has a dark side, and its name is Unetta. I apologize in advance for the crazy spelling. It's very distinct to Calabria. You say the word like Andronetta, and it comes from a Greek word meaning heroic or valorous. But like many words that come from much older ones, the meaning and intention have been greatly obscured because the Andronetta are not heroes. They're not valiant or defiant. They are scum. They are cowards and a plague to anyone and everyone unfortunate enough to cross their path. Not long after I turned 14 years old, my mother told me that she could not afford to give me money anymore. I had a small allowance for things, much like American children do, but there soon came a time when I wanted more than my meager allowance would permit. So instead of raising my allowance, she asked a friend to find me a job. Nothing big, just something small. So I had a few thousand L to spend each week. Soon I had a job. I was told that I would be working in a small nightclub, just a few hours on a Friday and Saturday night. I suspect my mother believed that I would be disappointed that I no longer had those times of the weekend to myself, but it was actually the opposite. I was worried that she would find me something boring, like working in a supermarket, or something disgusting, like working in a slaughterhouse. So. To learn that I would spend my time watching beautiful women dancing and drinking, that was some very welcome news to a 14-year-old boy like myself. There were only around two or three nightclubs in Erie where I lived, spreading along the Corso Victorio U, which is the road nearest to the beach. They were all spread out for a reason as each club was the responsibility of a different Unanet captain, or capo, as they say. All these capos were part of the same Unanet clan, but they were not immune from internal disputes and rivalries. The story goes that after one of the capos mysteriously went, missing his deputy, another capo stepped up to take his place. However, one of the other capos protested, saying the missing capo was his brother-in-law, and until he was found, he had the right to take over responsibility for the missing capo's nightclub, as well as his own. He told the missing capo's Andrina, which is like his personal gang members, to move out so his own crew could take over, but the original Andrina refused. They accused the other capo of orchestrating their boss's disappearance, an accusation that was returned by the man's brother-in-law. The two groups squabbled for a while, but the Kim, which is something like the higher council, told them to stop while they tried to track down the missing capo. I worked in the bar of the missing capo, although at the time I knew nothing of it. I knew some very suspicious looking guys used to hang out around the nightclub, looking mean and not drinking very much, but I didn't understand their wider connection to the invisible feud. I use that word deliberately too, because that's where the unete are in America. If gangsters like to represent themselves, they wear colors, they make signs, they make graffiti marking their territory. But in Erie, there was nothing like that. The Unete are invisible. They are your neighbor, your coworker, your brother, your cousin. 
and all but a few dozen are known only to each other. They act only in the darkness. They emerge from the shadows and disappear again. I remember cycling down to the Corso Victorio U to begin my shift on a Friday evening. Erie is quite lively at that time of the evening, especially on a weekend, and the nightclub I worked at was no different. I walked in, and the place was full. Lots of people upstairs, and lots of people downstairs also. The way the club was set up, when you walk in, there's a bar and a few tables for people to sit at. Then downstairs is the dance floor, but the upstairs has a kind of balcony, which overlooks the dance floor, but not by much. The club was very busy, and I was going upstairs and downstairs, collecting empty bottles and glasses as I went. I had just collected two armfuls of empty wine glasses, which probably wasn't a lot for a kid like me. I'd placed them up onto the bar top for the bartender to wash. I then turned around in time to see a guy walking up to the small balcony. I'd never seen him before, and we had a lot of the same people coming in week after week, so I noticed him almost right away. His behavior was also a little strange to me, because I'd say 99% of all people who walked in went straight to the bar to get a drink before heading down to the dance floor. So, to have this man ignore the bar completely and walk straight to the balcony, it was almost like he was looking or watching for someone. The bartender and I watched the guy for a minute, wondering why he was just standing there, still like a statue. Then, someone else came to the bar, so we got back to work. But then, just as I was walking away from the bar, I saw the strange man take something out of the pocket of his jacket and then toss it over the side of the balcony. He then turned and walked away so calmly that it made the action seem almost sort of innocent. I watched him walk towards the front entrance and then turned back to walk towards the balcony. I was worried that he might have tossed a bottle or an empty glass down onto the dance floor. Then, I was wondering how that might be possible if he hadn't visited the bar. And then there was a bang. At first, the noise and concussion of the blast scared me so much that I almost fell backwards. There was no fire. It wasn't like an explosion you see in a movie. There was a bang, and then a puff of smoke, and then the music stopped and all I heard were people screaming. I ran to the balcony and could see lots of people lying on the dance floor. Most were moving around in pain, holding parts of themselves that had been hurt, but two or three were just lying completely still. Many of those who weren't affected by this explosion began running up the stairs away from the wounded people and out of the club but many others stayed and tried to help. The bartender told me to stand at the bottom of the stairs and to help wounded people climb them. He did the same, and soon, only the worst affected were still lying on the floor with their friends, trying to stop the bleeding from their wounds. The ambulances were outside very quickly, and after the paramedics came inside, and I asked the bartender if I could help any further. He seemed angry that I'd asked him, which I suppose, looking back, was him realizing that I shouldn't have been there in the first place. I was just a kid, and he asked me to help with the wounded. I guess he felt guilty about that, so he snapped at me and told me to just go home. I had wanted to run out of that place since the moment I heard the bang and saw the wounded people, but for some reason, I stayed. And I think it was more out of pure curiosity in a sort of morbid way. Once I finally realized what had happened, or at least that something truly terrible had happened, I was only too glad to jump on my bike and go home. From where we lived, my mom could hear all the sirens 
and see all the flashing lights. So when I walked through the door with blood on my clothes and terror in my eyes, she knew instantly that I had somehow been involved. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried a lot in her arms. I wasn't scared anymore, but it was all the tension being let loose, like some sort of river. I was just so glad to be home, alive, and in her embrace. The next day, the police came to talk to me about the attack. They visited in the daytime. Leon and Jetta, on the other hand, they visited us at night. They were far more thorough than the police officers. They asked me more questions, demanded more details, and obviously wanted to find the man who'd thrown the explosive onto the dance floor much more than the police did. I don't know if they ever did, but a lot of people died in the process. Like I said, the violence is mostly done quietly and in the shadows, but for a while, Erie and the surrounding region erupted into violence as the two rival Andrina fought one another. It got so bad that my mother sent me to live with my cousins up in Kenza, which is a town quite far to the north of Erie, until things had died down. I eventually returned home with my parents, but my mother was never fully happy there again. A few years later, we moved to Reggio Calabria, and that's where we've been. Living here in Reggio Calabria, we've been much happier, I think. Loy still holds a special place in our hearts, but there are one too many bad memories for us to be at peace there. For me, it's the memories of the blood and the screaming. How I'd stared in disbelief until it hit me later while hugging my mom. But for her, it was having that silent and invisible monster that stalks Calabria suddenly becoming very loud and very visible when it almost took her only son. This event took place when I was in college and occurred way before there were things like cell phones. I was an undergraduate at the time, attending a school located in the Appalachian Mountains in a small town. I soon came to realize that the townies, the people who grew up there, didn't much care for us students. I was a junior at the time, and it happened during a cold winter. I had heard a story regarding a certain townie who liked to frequent a popular bar called The Club. It was a place frequented by both students and townies. The way the story went, this guy would come out on Saturday evenings to pick fights with students. The past weekend, he had sat down at a table uninvited where a group of students were drinking beer. He just sat there, silent and very unwelcome. Eventually, he grabbed the thigh of a male student and then assaulted them when the student gripped him by the arm and told him to let go. Supposedly, the students all had to go to the hospital due to injuries sustained during the beating, and the owner didn't do a thing about it. Also being a townie, I guess. The next Saturday night rolled around, and I told my buddies, let's teach this jerk a lesson. I was raised by my dad not to be a victim and to look out for my friends. I played pool and poker to help put myself through school, so I knew how to handle myself. Having heard that the townie liked to punch his victims in the solar plexus, I got some magazines and taped them around my torso with a roll of electrical tape. I also got an empty glass Coke bottle and put it in a jacket pocket. We waited until around 10 p.m. and then headed over to the bar, getting a table and leaving one chair empty beside me. We were enjoying a cold pitcher of Pabst when one of my friends told me that he was there. We made sure not to look at him and kept on drinking. Eventually, he came over and sat down in the empty chair beside me. Casually, I turned to look at him and smiled. And sure enough, he immediately grabbed me by my leg. 
Hey there, fella, I said, still smiling as I took another sip of beer. He had a hard grip on my thigh as he stared back at me, not saying a word. Well, you certainly aren't a shy one, I said, and my friends all laughed. It had grown silent. Everyone in the bar was watching now. I added a nice pinch of Copenhagen snuff between my cheek and gums. Then I spit into one of his eyes, causing him to involuntarily close both. Immediately, I punched him in the throat as hard as I could, knocking the creep backwards. He fell out of his seat, landing on his butt. Take this outside, yelled the owner from behind the bar. We stepped out into the back alley, followed by the townie, his eyes blazing with anger. He quickly came towards me. He took a swing, which I blocked as I pulled out that glass Coke bottle, gripping it by the neck. I swung back hard, landing a very savage blow against his thick skull. I felt it connect with a very satisfying thud. His head snapped back and he stumbled. I kicked his legs out from under him and then we circled around him and started kicking him with our steel-toed Doc Martens. He tried to get up, but we just kept kicking him as hard as we could, working up a good sweat. He must have tried not to yell or scream, but soon enough, he was crying like a baby. This went on for quite a while, until we eventually heard whining sirens approaching us. Let's go, I shouted, as we legged it out of there as fast as we could. Later, we were told that an ambulance had to come to the bar to cart off the unconscious townie on a stretcher. Needless to say, we didn't return to the club anytime soon, or anytime after that. The next year, I went back and saw a townie sitting in a wheelchair beside the bar. He looked like him, but he wasn't so big anymore and trembled a lot. He looked my way eventually and immediately broke eye contact. He never said another word. Oh well, I thought. He had brought it on himself. There are consequences to your actions. My name is Rosa, and I grew up in a place called Karen, which is about a 40 minute drive away from Glasgow in Scotland. It was a lovely place to grow up, and I have a lot of happy memories of the place. But as a teenager, it was very, very boring. Karen is a small village, and back when I was growing up there in the mid to late 80s, only about 1,500 people called it home. These days, the pubs have had a lick of paint, and there's a lovely cafe and restaurant opened up on the high street. But back then, there was basically nothing for younger people to do on the weekend. Karen is great for an older couple looking for somewhere quiet to retire. But for a bunch of restless teenagers, it felt more like the end of nowhere. Me and my friends used to get the number 10 bus into Glasgow most Saturdays, but it was an hour's journey each way. So, unlike the girls who lived on the outskirts of the city, who would wobble home in their stilettos or jump a taxi home for a fiver, we had to fork out 30 or 40 quid between us just to get home. And that's if we could even find a cab driver who could be bothered to drive that far out of Glasgow city center when they could be making a mint, ferrying drunk people from club to club. It was difficult, but not impossible. And we tried a fair few times when we were 16 and 17 to sneak into clubs without getting ided. But the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, as they say and we resigned ourselves to waiting until we were all 18 before really having a crack at that legendary Glasgow nightlife. It was all a bit depressing, really. We felt proper left out in the cold. But then, one day, during the summer before our final year of sixth form, which is the same as a high school senior in America, we heard about this DIY nightclub event taking place in an old farmhouse not too far from home. 
in the past, all me and my mates had done was hang around a few crappy clubs in the center of Glasgow while being turned away from the better ones because we, we were 17 and didn't possess any IDs. So the prospect of attending an unsanctioned rave that promised to be wilder, more affordable, and didn't require proof of age seemed like precisely what we had unknowingly been waiting for. Don't get me wrong. Initially, the idea made us a bit nervous. However, as we found out that a few other friends from our sixth form planned to attend, our excitement grew steadily until we were absolutely determined to go. It helped that we discovered tickets were only three pounds, which made the event seem somewhat official, at least on the surface. But in reality, these tickets were nothing more than printouts from a computer using old school Microsoft Word art. The organizers used the proceeds to rent their sound equipment. It was a completely guerrilla operation, and that's what made it so appealing. We didn't fully consider the other implications of being part of such an off-the-radar, do-it-yourself kind of party. On the night in question, we had to fabricate a story for our parents, telling them we were going to a party in Glasgow, not a nightclub, just a friend's birthday gathering, or something similar. Then, when the time came, we ordered a taxi that our parents believed would take us to the train station. In reality, it transported us to a farmhouse a few miles outside of town, where the rave's organizers had set up their sound system. The place looked like an absolute mess. They had barely cleaned it up before setting everything up. Surprisingly, when we walked in with our tickets in hand, no one paid much attention to whether we had them or not. More importantly, they assumed we were of age. One of the guys was so thrilled to have some girls arrive that he gave us a half-empty two-liter bottle of vodka when we mentioned not having any drinks with us. The other challenging aspect of living in Kilner was obtaining alcohol and cigarettes. We couldn't convince the lady at the shop that we were 18 when she had attended our 17th birthday party just a week before. Getting our hands on alcohol and cigarettes had always been our biggest challenge. Yet, there we were, all dressed up, and these lads were literally giving it to us for free. It was like we had died and gone to heaven. We began dancing in our small group of three, passing around the half-empty bottle of vodka more and more people started to arrive. And before long, there were at least a hundred people crammed into different rooms of the old farmhouse. Even more people were chatting and dancing outside. As the party really got going, the music grew louder, and the atmosphere became even more electrifying. It was just wild, total chaos, but with the best vibes. That was until my friend Lucy noticed someone selling pills out of a clear plastic baggie. We had never seen actual drugs up close before. I mean, we had trouble getting our hands on a bottle of Buckfast. So forget about Soap Bar or Whiz or anything like that. The guy eventually made his way to us and we asked what he was selling. When he mentioned ecstasy, we politely declined as we didn't have any money. Unlike the rave's organizers, who had shared some of their booze, the guy with the pills wasn't nearly as generous with his stash. We moved on when we declined the guy's offer, because to be honest, I was already feeling more adventurous than I had ever been. We continued drinking, kept dancing, and eventually reached the point where we all desperately needed to use the restroom. We knew the toilets in that place would be, at best, shocking, so we tried to hold it in as long as possible. We even joked about the idea of just running off into the bushes somewhere if the toilets turned out to be too disgusting. However, when we finally mustered the courage to go, 
we were met with an enormous queue. There was just one single outdoor toilet with working plumbing, which made me suspect that the organizers had rented the place. Or perhaps it was in a state of neglect that made it perfect for their purposes. God knows if the owners had any inkling of what they intended to do with the place. They might have thought twice about handing over the keys. But at that moment, we were in no position to wait in a queue for that long. So, we reverted to our initial plan of venturing into the bushes for a quick relief. Just down the way from the farmhouse, we spotted a long, overgrown hedge, and behind it, a cluster of trees. It seemed like a discreet spot, so we made our way over to it, skirting the edge and then disappearing into the trees for added cover. The last thing we wanted was for any guys to follow us and catch us with our pants down, quite literally. We walked for a minute or two, putting some distance between us and the hedge. Suddenly, I remember glancing to my left and being startled. Leaning against a tree was a girl with very pale features, just staring at me with a hazy, vacant look. She didn't appear well, but she wasn't menacing at all. It was her sudden appearance that startled me. After that initial shock, my friends and I started asking her if she was okay, as she looked very unwell. The poor girl was slurring her words, her jaw swinging, and she kept mumbling. I don't feel well. I just want to go home. We asked her what her name was, and she just repeated, I don't feel well, over and over again. We had to ask her several times before she finally managed to tell us her name. We then tried asking her if she had taken anything, but by that point, it was clear she needed some sort of medical assistance. Instead of continuing to question her, we decided to help her. One of my friends draped her arms over each of our shoulders, and we began to walk back toward the farmhouse. It took some time, but we managed to navigate around the edge and eventually returned to the farmhouse. We sat her down outside against the stone wall, and we asked the people around us for help. We were both surprised and disheartened by how indifferent some people seemed. Some total idiots openly didn't care and even made fun of the girl as she sat there, looking pale and unwell. However, enough good-hearted people did care, and eventually, we began to receive the assistance we desperately needed. We were in a desperate situation, and time was running out. Fortunately, we found someone who knew one of the organizers and mentioned that they had a van with them, which had been used to transport all the sound equipment. This van was our best chance to get the sick girl to the hospital. Unfortunately, there were no mobile phones back then at the farmhouse, and although there might have been some plumbing work done, there was no working phone line for us to use to call an ambulance. Our only option was to run to the nearest tarmac road and hope to catch the attention of a passing car. However, the situation was far too urgent to risk relying on something as uncertain as that. We needed someone with a vehicle who could drive, and we needed them immediately. The kind person who knew one of the organizers said they would go and fetch him. So, we waited where we were, hoping that one of the sick girl's friends might pass by and recognize her. We attempted to get their names from the girl, but she kept repeating her own name in confusion. There was no way for us to inform anyone that she was unwell, except to try to draw attention to her among passers-by, hoping that someone would recognize her. It all felt quite hopeless, especially as the girl's condition continued to deteriorate and our panic grew. But then, there was a brief moment of relief when one of the rave's organizers arrived after hearing about the emergency. We explained the situation to him, that 
this girl had consumed too much alcohol, among other things. At first, he seemed genuinely willing to help, saying, Oh yeah, I'll take your friend to the hospital. No problem at all. He appeared calm and confident, like a knight in shining armor coming to the rescue of a group of young damsels in distress. However, as soon as he saw the girl we were talking about, his demeanor changed drastically. It was as if he recognized her, or something about her that we weren't aware of. His expression underwent a dramatic shift, from calm and confident to almost frightened. When I asked him what was wrong, he mumbled that he'd be back in a minute, that he needed to talk to someone. I told him we didn't have time for that, but he ignored my plea and walked away. In my desperation, I tried to grab his wrist to stop him from leaving, but he reacted by violently throwing me off and shooting me an angry look before disappearing into the crowd. I knew I shouldn't have grabbed him like that, but the feeling of helplessness had escalated to an unbearable level. Suddenly, we went from thinking everything would be fine to wondering what on earth was happening. What made the situation even worse was that very few people around us seemed to be taking it remotely seriously. Drunk lads approached the semi-conscious girl and made inappropriate and lewd comments like, hey, want a cab back to my place and have some fun? We had to sternly inform them that it wasn't funny and that people could get seriously ill from consuming too much alcohol. That's when one lad spoke up and said something like, she hasn't just had too much to drink. She's had a pill and it's not agreeing with her. She needs water and an ambulance. We asked how he knew she had taken a pill as if he had some kind of mystical ability to decipher the condition of those who were in trouble. He simply replied, because I watched her take it. I'll be back with a bottle of water. That's when our panic intensified because it became increasingly evident that the girl hadn't just overindulged in alcohol. The situation was dire. The girl was clearly overdosing on ecstasy she exhibited signs of overheating, profuse sweating, confusion, and was on the brink of losing consciousness. If the organizer with the van didn't get her to the hospital soon, she would be in grave danger. I grew tired of waiting for the guy to return, so I decided to go looking for him. A few minutes later, I found him engaged in a conversation with another guy and although I couldn't hear what they were saying, the person he was talking to seemed completely engrossed in the conversation. I walked up to them, feeling a sense of urgency, and said something along the lines of, what are you waiting for? We need to get that girl to a hospital. However, the moment he realized I had followed him inside, he became visibly angry and told me to wait outside, insisting that he would be there in a few minutes. It was then that I realized something unsettling. The person he was talking to was the same guy who had offered to sell us pills only about an hour earlier. The organizer knew that the girl was overdosing, yet he appeared to prioritize his drug dealer friend over a girl who was in grave danger after taking something he had sold her. While I couldn't understand the specifics of their conversation, I imagined that the organizer might have been warning his dealer friend that the police could potentially arrive soon, as he was about to drive a girl to the hospital after she had taken one of his pills. It baffled me that this wasn't just a brief two-sentence conversation Someone's life hung in the balance, and these two individuals were having a casual discussion instead of taking immediate action to save her. 
I didn't return to wait with my friends. I stayed where I was, growing angrier by the minute. Where was the man who had initially claimed to have everything under control? He had vanished the moment he realized that his actions might impact his friend's profit margin. If just hearing about this infuriates you, imagine how I felt having to stand there and witness it unfold. Sadly, this is where I made a grave mistake. My anger got the better of me, and I started hitting him. I didn't deliver proper closed fist punches or anything like that, but I began open-handedly smacking him on his shoulder. My intention was mainly to get his attention, but my fury got the best of me, and it quickly escalated into a minor assault. I was screaming at him, what are you waiting for? We need to go now. In response, he abruptly turned around, shoved me back into the crowd of people, and chaos erupted. I'm not excusing my actions. It's never acceptable to resort to physical violence when words could have sufficed. But in the heat of the moment, with a girl's life hanging in the balance, I lost control of my emotions and reacted inappropriately. All anyone around us saw was a large, burly guy shoving a petite girl before she went tumbling into the crowd of people. It was clear that he was in the wrong. And immediately, a group of tough individuals began advancing toward him. Their intentions were crystal clear. They wanted to take him to task for pushing a girl. In essence, they were saying, so, you think it's okay to shove a girl? Well, why don't you try shoving me, big man? In case that gets lost in translation somehow, they were ready to administer a beating because he had pushed a girl and they meant business. It quickly escalated into a violent brawl with the organizer and his dealer friend pitted against about five lads who had emerged from the crowd throwing punches it was a horrifying scene, not just because of the sudden and intense eruption of violence, but also because I believed I had ruined our best chance of getting the overdosing girl to the hospital. I tried desperately to break up the fight, but I got knocked over again. I remember starting to cry as a kind stranger pulled me away from the chaos and asked if I was okay. I couldn't find the words to respond, so I essentially grabbed the guy by his wrist and led him outside to where the girl and my friends were. It was a terrible scene. The girl remained unconscious, and despite our concerns, my friends kept saying, oh my god, Rosa, she's unconscious now. We have to do something. That's when we finally did what we should have done about 10 to 15 minutes earlier. We picked up the unconscious girl and carried her to the nearest road in hopes of flagging down a passing driver. I recall that it was the summer before our mock A-levels. So even though it was around 10 p.m., there was still enough light for us to follow the path back to the road relatively easily. The kind stranger had enlisted the help of two of his mates, and they carried the unconscious girl to the road while my friends and I ran ahead to flag down a car. There were a few more minutes of feeling hopeless as we stood there waiting for a car to appear. When one finally did, there was an added fear that it wouldn't stop for us. I personally thought it wasn't out of the question for someone to see a group of frantic teenagers carrying an unconscious girl and just decide not to get involved. However, luck was on our side this time. The driver pulled over, wound down the window, and asked what was happening. They only needed to hear the word overdose before they were shouting, get her into the back. The driver was alone in the car so there was enough room for me, my two friends, and the girl who was overdosing. Unfortunately, there wasn't room for the lads who had helped us earlier. 
they just waved us off, encouraging us to go. And the driver sped off toward Vale of Levin Hospital without hesitation. Over in Alexandria, nearly everyone we encountered, from the driver to the doctors and nurses at Vale of Levin Hospital, assumed that we were the girl's friends. In a way, I suppose we were, given the absence of the people she had attended the rave with. However, we had to clarify that we were just strangers and didn't know the girl at all. But even if we did, once we got her to the hospital, that was where our involvement with her came to an end. At the hospital, there was a waiting room with a payphone. Rather than walking out into town with no way of getting home, I decided to call my parents and begged them to come pick us up. Of course, there was the issue of us having lied about where we were going, and my mom was initially furious. However, by the time my parents arrived to give us a lift home, their attitudes had shifted significantly. I suppose they must have talked about it during the drive over. Yes, we had lied about our whereabouts, but all we had done was drink a bit of vodka, not even all that much, before stumbling upon the girl who was overdosing. After that, we had taken responsibility for her, and it's likely that she would have died if we hadn't intervened. Don't get me wrong, our social lives were scrutinized for months afterward but we weren't punished for lying as we would have been otherwise. None of my friends faced any repercussions either. It wasn't a major media story or anything like that. So we couldn't stay updated on the girl's condition through newspapers or television. I think the girl's family would have been furious if anything had appeared in the papers. But the truth was, we didn't even know her name. The only thing I could have done was call the hospital to try and speak to some of the nurses who were on shift that night. But for some reason, I didn't. Perhaps because it was such a sensitive situation involving an overdose. I didn't want to interfere or inject myself into the situation, if that makes sense. So I went on hoping that she made a full recovery and assumed that I wouldn't hear anything else about it. My hope that I wouldn't hear anything more about the incident was proven untrue when the police unexpectedly showed up at my parents' house. They wanted to know if I knew anything about who might have given the girl the pill. And since I had a good look at the guy who had offered us pills, I passed along his description to the police. Some might call me a grass or informer, but honestly, I didn't care. If the dealer and his friend had taken immediate action, rushed the girl to the hospital, and genuinely taken responsibility for the situation, I might not have been so quick to report them. However, since they had acted like complete cowards, hesitating while a girl's health was in serious jeopardy, I didn't think twice about providing the information to the authorities. I doubted that the police would be able to locate the guy based solely on my vague description. But if it could help in any way, that was a good thing. I understand that teenagers will always go out and experiment with drugs. But if the people selling them drugs are willing to take their money and then refuse to help when they have a bad reaction, they deserve to be held accountable, in my opinion. Before all of this happened, I used to work in a nightclub that stayed open until 5 a.m. Those last couple of hours could get pretty rough. We had a strict door policy, but there was little we could do about people who showed up semi-sober around midnight and then ended up completely intoxicated by closing time. Closing time was always a chaotic process, especially on weekends when all the patrons would spill out onto the streets at roughly the same time. Outside the club, you'd witness a mix of emotions, romance, drama, 
and the occasional fight, slowly but surely the crowd would disperse, with people either hailing cabs or deciding to walk home. Then there was this one particular incident that stood out. A guy had been kicked out around closing time for trying to start fights with people inside the club. He was completely wasted, engaging in posturing and sloppy shoving, so he wasn't a significant threat to anyone. However, after being ejected from the club, he remained outside, continuing to harass anyone who exited. The presence of the bouncers alone kept him somewhat at bay, after we officially closed, he persisted in bothering people, but somehow managed to avoid any violence. I believe he was so intoxicated and incapable that people didn't perceive him as worth the effort. Plus, by the time most patrons were leaving, he had lost his shirt and appeared to have vomited on himself a little, making people want to keep their distance from him let alone engage in a fight. Gradually, the crowd began to disperse, leaving just the shirtless, intoxicated guy wandering in and out of the streets, attempting to harass passing cars. I remember my coworker calling me over, saying, get a load of this guy, he's still out there. At first, my coworker and I were simply laughing at the shirtless guy's antics, trying not to be seen through the large glass windows of the club. He was walking into the street and posturing at every passing car, as if he were challenging them to a fight. Each time he did it, my coworker and I couldn't help but burst into laughter, capturing his bizarre behavior on our phones. Cars were only passing by every few minutes because it was still around 6 a.m. And the streets hadn't fully woken up yet, so we had to wait in between all of his challenges. However, things took a sudden and shocking turn when a car drove past the guy, and he managed to land a kick on it that was so loud we heard it from inside the bar. The driver of the car laid on the horn, briefly stopped, and then sped away. The shirtless guy began laughing and gave the driver the finger, reveling in what he saw as a small victory over the car. That's when my coworker, with an eerie sense of foreboding, muttered, if he keeps doing that man, he's going to get himself hurt. Little did we know how prophetic those words would become. Almost immediately after she spoke, the same car the shirtless guy had kicked returned, hurtling towards him at high speed. The impact sent him spinning through the air. I remember recoiling from the window in sheer shock, and my coworker reacted the same way. She kept repeating, oh my god, oh my god. As the car reappeared, and reversed over the guy while he lay there on the ground. My coworker's screams grew more frantic, witnessing the guy's torso being crushed by the reversing tires. Both sets of them was an image that will haunt me for the rest of my life. The sound alone was one of the most gruesome things I had ever heard. A deep, sickening gunk, gunk, as each set of wheels ripped over him. And I do mean ripped, because after the second hit, you could see the blood where the rubber had dragged away the skin from his chest and back. I couldn't bear to look for too long. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, pacing back and forth on the floor in front of the bar as I focused on providing the dispatcher with all the information she needed. The EMTs arrived first, followed by two police officers who asked us several questions. Our manager bought us all drinks as a way of coping with the shock. Afterward, he stayed behind to collect all the relevant security camera footage for the police. The following evening, we were all given the night off because it was Sunday. In the aftermath of the incident, my boss and coworkers and I were all engaged in a group text, 
continuously updating each other on the situation. We were all anxious to know whether the shirtless guy was going to be okay. I realize it might sound somewhat naive, but people do survive some incredible injuries at times. However, the very next morning, we received the devastating news that he had died. The police had contacted our manager, informing him that since the guy had passed away, the investigation had turned into a homicide case. This meant we would all have to speak to the police again. This time with two homicide detectives involved who wanted to speak to anyone who had been on shift that night. Naturally, this meant me. The detectives were primarily interested in determining if the person who had run over the shirtless guy might have had a prior confrontation with him earlier that night. But from my perspective, it seemed entirely random. We rarely had people leaving the club, immediately getting into their cars and driving away for obvious reasons. So, from my vantage point, it appeared that the shirtless guy had the misfortune of kicking the car of someone who was in a very bad mood, possibly in a hurry on that early Sunday morning. Honestly, that's what makes this whole thing so terrifying. Everything unfolded so swiftly, and the guy confronted so many drivers who simply ignored him and drove away before he happened upon that one individual who, for whatever reason, reacted violently. It was that moment, turning around, hitting him, and then reversing over him afterward. What's so chilling about this is that it shows how fast a situation can escalate and how unpredictable people's reactions can be. That's why I've always made it a point to be polite, especially during tense situations. I don't allow people to walk all over me, and I believe that a person can be firm while still being respectful. It's about making concessions, but setting boundaries. I never want to be careless enough to provoke that one individual who has been simmering with anger and resentment all day and night, just waiting for an opportunity to take out their frustration on someone. I'm not talking about the kind of person actively seeking trouble. I'm talking about the real psychos, the ones who suppress their emotions, those with a hair-trigger temper, and a penchant for unleashing their rage on unsuspecting individuals. These are the types of people who can transform a seemingly innocuous encounter into a life-altering nightmare in an instant. One of the scariest experiences of my life occurred on what was arguably one of the most mundane nights I had ever encountered. I used to work in various bars and nightclubs all over London, switching from venue to venue as it suited me. Sometimes I'd leave a place for better pay elsewhere, and other times it was because my bosses or supervisors were just complete jerks. But this particular incident prompted me to hand in my notice at a place after going through something so terrifying that it haunted my nightmares for years. As anyone who's worked in bars or nightclubs will tell you, January is typically the quietest month of the year. People go all out for Christmas and New Year's, and then try to save money, and shed those holiday pounds as January begins. I imagine this has been the pattern for ages, and it's something us bar staff have to endure. You squirrel away your Christmas tips, to get through everyone's dry January and hope you get enough shifts to make it through the month. At first, I thought I was lucky because my name kept coming up on the greatly reduced rota. I went from working about 50 hours a week in December to less than 30 in January, which was undoubtedly a significant cut, but others had it far worse. On this particular night, it was so quiet that only our manager was tending to the front of the house 
while a colleague and I occupied ourselves with some early spring cleaning. The Christmas period had been chaotic, so there was plenty of tidying up to do. We organized the staff room upstairs and bagged up lost property. Then we headed down to the beer cellar to tidy that up as well. There were numerous empty boxes to crush and take out to the bins, so we got to work on that. We'd walk into the cellar, crush a few boxes, and then walk out again with our arms stacked full of crushed cardboard. Once we had completed the box crushing task, we decided to take a short break in the cellar. We spent no more than a few minutes sitting on top of some beer boxes, engaging in casual conversation. It was during this brief respite that I began to feel a headache coming on. At first, it was just a dull throb in my temples, nothing too out of the ordinary. I figured it was just a result of the stress and long hours from the holiday season. But as the minutes passed, the pain intensified. It felt as though someone had taken a sledgehammer to my head. I winced in discomfort, clutching my temples and grimacing. My colleague asked if I was all right, but all I could manage was a feeble nod as the pain made speaking nearly impossible. The sensation was unlike any headache I had ever experienced. It wasn't just the intensity of the pain, it was also the strange pulsating rhythm of it. It seemed to coincide with the dim, flickering light bulb hanging above us, which cast eerie shadows across the cellar. As I held my head in agony, I became aware of an unsettling noise, a faint, rhythmic tapping coming from somewhere nearby. The cellar, like most, was filled with rows of stacked crates and shelves of assorted alcohol and supplies. The tapping sound seemed to be emanating from behind one of the shelves, so I turned my gaze in that direction, squinting through the dim light to see what could possibly be causing the noise. That's when I noticed it. A pair of weathered leather shoes sticking out from behind the shelf. The shoes were attached to legs, which in turn were attached to a body. Someone hidden in the shadows, watching us, my heart began to race. And despite the excruciating pain in my head, I was filled with an overwhelming sense of dread. I exchanged a horrified glance with my colleague, whose expression mirrored my own fear. We hadn't heard anyone enter the cellar, and there was no reason for anyone to be down there with us. The tapping continued, growing slightly louder with each passing second. It was a deliberate, rhythmic sound, like someone tapping their fingers impatiently on a hard surface. As our eyes adjusted to the dimness, we began to make out more details of the intruder. He was dressed in a dark, tattered coat that hung loosely on his thin frame. His face was obscured by long, unkempt hair that fell in greasy strands over his features. He made no attempt to move or speak. He simply stood there, tapping away in the shadows. The situation was surreal and unsettling. We were trapped in the confined space of the cellar with this mysterious and potentially dangerous individual. Panic surged through me as I realized that we had no way of knowing what his intentions were or how he had managed to sneak up on us unnoticed. The headache still throbbed in my temples, but the fear of the unknown overshadowed the pain. My colleague and I exchanged another glance, silently communicating our growing sense of urgency. Without uttering a word, we both knew that we needed to get out of there as quickly and all that strong at first. So I made a mental note to grab a pair from the stash we kept upstairs. Then I continued talking to my colleague. However, after a minute or so, I started feeling even worse. I stood up, feeling a bit wobbly, and told my colleague something like, I'm feeling a bit strange, man. 
I'm just going to get some fresh air. He stood up too, and as I turned to walk towards the cellar door, he said something I'll never forget for as long as I live. Best get the bowl of car keys first though, Jay. I turned back for a second, quite certain that I was going completely mental, and asked my colleague to repeat himself. Just then, I watched his knees buckle, and he crashed into the stacks of beer boxes next to him. We stacked them in a particular way, so that impacts like that wouldn't take down a whole stack and endanger anyone with broken glass or something. But my colleague hit them so hard that I'd swear a few bottles must have broken from the force of that fall. At first, I was just stunned, but then it hit me. Dizziness, nausea, confusion, loss of consciousness. It was a gas leak, a carbon dioxide leak to be exact. Oh. And just to explain, the cellar of most bars has all their CO2 tanks, which we hook up to the bars upstairs via pipes so we can carbonate your drinks and make them all nice and fizzy. The leak was a massive one too. And because of the ambient hum of the old coolers down in our cellar, we couldn't hear the rush of gas from one of the barrels that was leaking. I ran out of the cellar, took a deep breath, and then ran back in to grab my colleague by one of his legs. I pulled harder than I'd ever pulled before and managed to drag his unconscious body out of the cellar and into the little hallway outside before I slammed the door closed. Then, in a total panic, I started trying to wake my colleague up slapping him in the face and shouting his name. I don't think I could ever properly describe the relief that I felt when he opened his eyes. He seemed really groggy and confused. He rolled over and suddenly threw up, which made me get up to try and keep him on his side. I didn't want him rolling back over and potentially choking on his own vomit. So I did that and then told him that I was going to get help. Trying to make it up the stairs was incredibly scary too. I kept thinking that I might pass out at any moment. The headache had intensified to the point where it felt like a vice was squeezing my skull. Every step was a struggle, but I had to get to the bar area. I needed to warn our manager about the gas leak and get medical help for my colleague. When I finally reached the bar area, our manager was still there completely unaware of the crisis unfolding in the cellar. I tried to speak, but my words were slurred and incoherent. My manager must have seen the panic in my eyes though, because he immediately rushed to my side and steadied me. I managed to croak out, gas, leak, downstairs, colleague. My manager's eyes widened with understanding and he quickly dialed 911, explaining the situation to the operator. Within minutes, the emergency services were on their way. My manager stayed with me, helping me stay conscious and providing reassurance that everything would be okay. I could see the worry in his eyes, but he remained calm and composed, which was exactly what I needed at that moment. When the paramedics arrived, they assessed my colleague, who was still groggy and disoriented, but conscious. They also checked me over, as the effects of the gas exposure had left me in a weakened state. Both of us were taken to the hospital for further evaluation and treatment. It turned out that we had suffered from carbon dioxide poisoning due to the leak in the cellar. The headache, dizziness, confusion, and nausea were all classic symptoms of CO2 exposure. We were fortunate that I had managed to get us out of the cellar in time, as prolonged exposure could have been fatal. As I lay in the hospital bed, receiving oxygen therapy to help flush the remaining carbon dioxide from my system, I couldn't help but think 
about how close we had come to a tragic outcome. It had been a terrifying experience. One that made me acutely aware of the dangers that could lurk in the most unexpected places. The gas leak had been caused by a faulty CO2 tank regulator in the cellar, and steps were taken to ensure that such an incident wouldn't happen again. The incident served as a stark reminder of the importance of safety protocols and regular equipment maintenance. My colleague and I were lucky to have survived that night, and the experience left a lasting impression on both of us. We emerged from the ordeal with a newfound appreciation for life's fragility and a deeper bond forged through our shared brush with danger. To this day, whenever I step into a cellar, I can't help but remember that chilling sensation of dizziness and nausea, serving as a reminder of that fateful night when a seemingly ordinary shift took a terrifying turn. It's a story I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. A constant reminder to never underestimate the hidden dangers that may lurk in the most ordinary of places. Blackout. And it would probably be ages before our manager came looking for us. I was also scared of falling backward and toppling down the stairs, potentially breaking my neck. I remember holding on really tight to the railing that went up the side of the staircase. As I spilled through the staff-only door and out into the bar itself, I shouted to my manager to call an ambulance. There was only one couple sitting at the bar, and they were amazing. One of them had their phone out and was dialing 999 before my manager had even stopped whatever she was doing. It wasn't like she had panicked or didn't care. She just froze in fright when I shouted at her. The cool-headed patron, who probably had a few drinks in him already, was just on it like a comet. The worst was over, as I had already dragged my colleague out of the cellar where the gas leak was. So, by the time my manager and I got back downstairs, he was sitting on the stairs, leaning against the wall, almost fully conscious again. He looked red in the face, like he'd been running around in our absence. Since I still wasn't feeling great myself, I was scared to try and support him coming up the stairs. Thankfully, my manager and one of the couples at the bar teamed up to basically drag my sick colleague back up the stairs. An ambulance showed up a few minutes later, took us both off to the hospital, and the doctors confirmed that both sets of symptoms were consistent with acute carbon dioxide poisoning. We were told just how incredibly lucky we had been. Most incidents of CO2 poisoning are slow-burning affairs, and the victims often notice the milder symptoms long before it has a chance to kill them. In our case, a ton of carbon dioxide was being pumped into the cellar very quickly, so we were being exposed to a much larger amount in a much shorter time. The doctors had absolutely no doubt that if my colleague and I had passed out in that cellar at the same time, or if I had failed to pull him out in time, someone would have lost their life that night. While we were receiving treatment at a local accident and emergency department, the incident served as a sobering reminder of how quickly and unexpectedly life can take a dangerous turn. It was a night that I would never forget, a stark reminder of the hidden dangers that can lurk even in seemingly mundane places like a bar cellar. From that day on, safety protocols and equipment checks became a top priority, not just at that bar, but in my mindset as well. I learned to never underestimate the potential hazards in any environment and to always be vigilant, even during the quietest of nights. Reversed, he would have done the same for me. Our shared experience, while harrowing, 
forged a bond between us that extended beyond our time at that particular bar. The settlement money allowed both of us to move on and explore new career opportunities. It's not every day you receive a windfall like that. And while the circumstances were far from ideal, it did provide a silver lining in the form of financial security. I can understand how unsettling and life-changing events like these can shape one's perspective on safety and priorities. It's a reminder that life can take unexpected turns, and it's essential to be prepared for both the ordinary and the extraordinary. I'm glad to hear that you and your colleague made it out of that situation, and I hope you both have found new paths that bring fulfillment and happiness. Thank you for sharing your story. It's important to remember that acts of basic human decency and kindness can have a profound impact, regardless of the context. Your quick thinking and actions in that gas leak incident saved lives, and that's something to be proud of. I appreciate your willingness to share your experiences, and I hope you continue to find fulfillment and happiness in your future endeavors. If you ever have more stories or need assistance with anything else, feel free to reach out. Take care. <laughs>